Oh, I can't read anymore. You know what that book has got me thinking about? It's got me thinking about villains. Those whose very names are synonymous with evil in our pop culture. Figures like Hannibal Lecter or Darth Vader. Oh, and of course, Biff Tannen. You know, Biff from the Back to the Future trilogy. He's the bully that terrorizes the main characters over generations. Seriously. You don't know him. He's iconic. You have to know him. Look, I'll prove to you how iconic he really is. AFI's Top 100 Heroes and Villains. Okay, I'm going to go through the list. Okay, figures he's number one. All right, he's sort of an anti-hero, but sure. Just hold on. He's going to be on here. What? Who in the hell is baby Jane Hudson? You're kidding me. He's not on the list. Biff isn't on this list. Whatever. The American Film Institute obviously doesn't know <laughs> Fine, I'll admit it. Biff Tannen isn't exactly on the tip of everybody's tongues when they're thinking of greatest villains of all time. But if you look at his personality and his actions, you'll see that he's truly a monster. And Biff represents the kind of real evil we see in our everyday lives, not some kind of metaphorical evil from another timeline. Whoa, this is heavy. With that, let's turn on the flux capacitor, get this baby up to 88 miles per hour, and send this video out of time. I'm Keenan H. Crotty, a.k.a. Keen Man, and this is Biff is Pure Evil. <laughs>
At first, Biff comes off as your sort of stereotypical high school bully, which is pretty accurate. We see him heckling and pushing around younger kids. Yeah. Is this your ball? Yeah. Is this your ball? You want it back? Yeah. Yeah. Go get it! <laughs> His peers. And you're fly. I thought I told you never to come in here. Well, it's gonna cost you. How much money you got on you? And even maintaining this behavior into his 40s. And uh, where's my reports? Uh, well, I haven't finished those up yet, but you know, I, I figured since they were due to... Hello? <laughs> Hello? Anybody home? Oh, huh? Think, McFly. Right. Think. I gotta have time yeah. to get them retyped. Yeah. Uh, do you realize what would happen if I handed my reports in your handwriting? Yeah. I'll get fired. You wouldn't want that to happen, would you? Would you? None of these actions are particularly heinous, though definitely makes him a dick. What are you looking at, butthead? But, as the movies progress, we begin to see that Biff does far more than your typical bully. In just the first film, we see him commit three major offenses. Assault, attempted murder, and attempted rape. Ah, oh, that's about as funny as a screen door on a battleship. Yeah... The attempted murder is first. It happens after Marty socks Biff in the face while he's attempting to defend his father, George. Afterwards, Biff and his gang chase after Marty in the town square. With his car. Marty just barely manages to avoid being pancaked because of his skateboarding skills. Because this is an 80s movie, and of course. Thanks a lot, kid. Biff's assault and attempted rape happens near the climax of the film. Here, Marty's engaged in a very edible plan to make sure that his parents fall in love to ensure that he's born in the future. Man, if you haven't seen this movie, that sounds real weird. Anyway, the plan has a minor hiccup when Biff, not George, finds Marty and then Biff's him right in the gut. You cost 300 bucks damage to my car, you son of a bitch. I'm gonna take it out of your ass. Lorraine, Marty's mother, protests, but soon regrets catching the attention of Biff Access Hollywood Tannen. Hey, when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab him by the Now, one might, if they're an asshole, point out that we learn in the sequel that Biff is likely intoxicated during this encounter. To that, I say that is not an excuse, and you're an awful person. Not to mention, Biff was more than willing to MURDER someone while totally sober. Also, this is not the first time that Biff alludes to his rapey predilections in this film. What you want? You know you want it. You know you want me to give it to you. Shut your filthy mouth! I'm not that kind of girl! Happily, Biff is stopped when George finally arrives and delivers a totally not telegraph from a mile away punch right to his butthead face. <laughs> Moving on to the second film, we meet old Biff in the year 2015, who bears a striking resemblance to Wayland from Prometheus. Now, Old Biff seems relatively harmless, if cantankerous, but don't let those hiked-up-to-your-man-boobs pants fool you. Old Biff comes to learn about the time machine, and he manages to steal it in order to do some time shenanigans. You mean shenanigans? No! Oh. You're talking about shenanigans, right? Put those away! Old Biff takes a sports almanac from 2015 and travels back to 1955 in the timeline of the original film to deliver it to his 18-year-old self. Old Biff then instructs his younger counterpart to use the book as a means to get rich by betting off of games which he would know the results of. Old Biff then travels back to 2015 in order to return the time machine before Marty and Doc Brown notice. Marty and Doc Brown then get into the time machine and travel back to 1985, their present timeline. 
Except they find out what happens when a homicidal wannabe rapist with knowledge of the future becomes a powerful multi-millionaire. That is what had become of Marty's idyllic small town of Hill Valley under the rise of a rich and powerful Biff Tannen. The town hall had been demolished for a gaudy and classless hotel and casino, and the rest of the town had devolved into a warriors-esque hellscape of gang violence. Hey, As for the evil things Biff does, there are things considered more douchey, such as the rampant cheating on his now wife Lorraine. Hey, what the hell's going on? Uh, hey, what the hell are you doing in here? Party's over, Biff. Sorry, ladies. But that is to be expected from a guy like Biff. What is unexpected is how much he amps up the villainy in this second film. It's almost too much to enumerate in a short recap, but. I'm going to do it anyway because longer videos are good for the analytics. Biff's evil acts include abusing his stepchildren, <laughs> Damn it, Biff. attempted murder again, this time with a gun, <laughs> the straight up murder of Marty's dad, George. Besides, they couldn't match up the bullet that killed your old man! Now, those are all terrible, but it gets worse. Biff's actions in this film affect hundreds, if not thousands of lives that he's not even actively trying to ruin. One, Biff says that he owns the police force. I own the police! Which to me implies that he does a whole slew of illegal and evil things that he needs covered up. Two, Biff owns a nuclear waste disposal company, which I kind of get the feeling he probably doesn't have the strictest of environmental regulations set up. So it's probably safe to assume that he's irradiating whole swaths of land and poisoning untold numbers of people. So there we have it. I've listed off the most egregious of Biff's actions throughout the films. Yet, some of you may recall that I have two criteria for determining true evil. So what about Biff's intentions place him among the upper echelons of pure villainy? My father. You're supposed to be in Switzerland, you little son of a bitch! Simply put, Biff really loves being evil. Time and time again, the movies show that Biff not only has a blatant disregard for how his actions harm people, but he seems to really enjoy it. In the first film, we see Biff smile with devilish delight at the idea of breaking George's arm after his attempted rape of Lorraine, and at Lorraine's futile attempts to stop him. Leave him alone! Let him go! Let him go! <laughs> that is not the face of someone that looks even a teeny tiny bit guilty or remorseful. In the second movie, we see a similar look on his face when he's trying to GTA Marty's ass again. <laughs> and if Biff's physical reactions aren't enough for you, then you only have to listen to how proud Biff from the alternate 1985 sounds when he confesses to George's murder. I suppose it's poetic justice. Two McFlies with the same gun. Did you catch that? Not only does he boast about getting away with the crime, Biff is excited that he gets to kill both the father and son. Clearly, he's not only immoral, but he freaking loves it. <laughs> ah, here we are, at the end. Having spent probably too many minutes examining why a fictional person from a three decade old film is a piece of shit. But all kidding aside, I do think that this matters. Biff Tannen may not be as iconic as some other villains. 
Yet he should be. Biff isn't an allegorical representation of evil like Heath Ledger's Joker, nor is he an obviously psychologically disturbed individual like Norman Bates. Biff is someone we all know. A loudmouthed, entitled jerk who bullies others to get what he wants. With Biff, there is no abstraction. He is the evil we confront in our daily lives. You only have to look at real-world dictators in order to find your actual Biffs. Back to the Future is this crazy sci-fi action comedy movie from the 80s that offers us an important lesson that's still valuable to this day. Every time we're shown Biff engaging in some kind of evil, we're also shown someone like Marty who stands up to him. All right, punk. Yeah, it's scary to confront the Biffs in our lives. And honestly... We're probably going to take a few hits. But to paraphrase a famous quote, evil only succeeds if people do nothing to stop it. That's why it's our duty. <laughs> said duty. It's our duty to make sure that we're not chickens. Nobody calls me <sighs> chicken. And fight against the biffs of the world when we see them. Because if we don't, we don't have the option to go back in time to kick their pure evil asses. Well, I'm Keen H. Crotty, a.k.a. Keen Man, and this was Why Biff is Pure Evil. Adios. <laughs>